Uh, my name is Atik Kasani. I'm an operations engineer at Skyrora. Um, I'm going to be talking to you guys about the last five years that I spent at university, my experiences, um, and what I learned working on rocketry and space projects, why I got into all of this in the first place, and how I basically, those five years are the story of how I got here to my role at Skyrora. Um, so I'm an international student. I'm originally from Sri Lanka. So any international students uh, watching or listening, you know, it's possible, you can do this. It's difficult, as as I'll be telling you, but it's definitely achievable. Um, so, so keep the faith. And yeah, so there we go. The first thing, um, most important thing is why did I get into aerospace? Like what? What, in, what set me on this journey? I think that's that's a good starting point. And that began for me six years ago. Um, I had just finished my A-levels and I was thinking of what to do for university. I wasn't too sure. I was It was either aerospace or cybersecurity. And I was interested in lots of things, but I didn't really find something that pulled me towards it. And 2015, I had just finished my A-levels. And one day I was having lunch, sat down at my laptop, and I opened up YouTube and by pure coincidence, uh, at the center of the homepage, there was this documentary called Space Race, this image on the left. It's a BBC documentary from 2005, and it talks about the events of the space race between the Americans and the Soviets, um, beginning with the end of World War II, all the way up to the moon landings. And that it's a bit cliche to say, but that documentary changed my life um, because it was the greatest story of human ingenuity that I'd ever heard of. Um, it, just the absolute definition of ambition and achievement. And, you know, you've heard the phrase, you can do it if you set your mind to it. And, and that story for me was the embodiment of that. Um, and these two gentlemen in the right hand side, that's Dr. Werner von Braun on the top and Sergei Korolev on the bottom, the chief designers of the American and the Soviet space programs. They are the main focus of the documentary and these two guys, they instantly became heroes of mine and they still are. When I wrote my master's thesis, I dedicated it to both of them for inspiring me on this journey. So this is the, this is the beginning for me. Like if there's anything you take away from this, this is it. Find your calling, find your purpose, find your ambition, um, find something that if you that you have to do, that if you don't do it, it's going to drive you out of your mind, because that will pull you through any obstacle, any hardship, or anything like that. So after that, uh, I decided to do aerospace, came to the UK, and the first two years at university, uh, my university, Sheffield Hallam, we didn't really have any space projects, so I found the next best thing, which was drones. And first year, I uh, was in charge of a team designing drones. We had absolutely no knowledge of, of aerodynamics or structures or anything like that. We, was, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> and the image on the left is the first structure that we built. I was in charge of CAD design. And you can probably tell looking at it, um, there were lots of mistakes that I made. So one of the things is I didn't consider skinning the actual aircraft. So we had these wooden ribs that we would lay uh, the skin over. And because I didn't consider that, the gap is too big and the skin just didn't attach. So yeah, a lot of mistakes like that. And um, the biggest thing I learned from this project is something called tunnel vision when you manage engineering projects. So if you're too focused on one thing and you lose sight of everything else, by the time you get to those things, you've made so many mistakes that you haven't thought about in the first place. So one very good thing when you're approaching a technical project is always think about multiple different aspects at the same time. So when you're designing, think about manufacture, think about assembly and make sure you incorporate that into your design and into the decisions that you make, because it'll really solve a lot of problems later down the line. Uh, that's the biggest thing I learned from this. And I took that knowledge into my second year. So the images on the right are the drone that we built in our second year. Um, as you can see, I, I, I designed stringers into it, into the fuselage and the wings to skin it properly, and we were able to skin it. I uh, took it to the competition, which was, I think it was held near Nottingham, um, and we placed fifth out of 11 teams on our first try, which was quite good. Um, but again, the real takeaway from that was what we learned from it, the engineering experiences, um, and, and what I talked about in terms of tunnel vision. Uh, so the next thing that I want to mention is uh, the Sunride altitude record, um, which was broken in 2019. So I wasn't a part of Sunride at this point. I had gone on placement, um, 
However, the chief designer for this rocket is a good friend of mine who now works at Inmarsat. Uh, he was a he studied with me at my university in my same course, and when I went on placement, he went on to complete his final year, and he was the main designer for this rocket, working on the entire stability. That CFD on the left is his work, and he also designed the fins for this rocket. Um, it's a, it's a very cool design. It starts at a, with a subsonic fin and then goes to a supersonic fin at the tip, so it works in both regimes. Uh, quite cool design, and and one of the key reasons why we were able to break the altitude record. So I've got a video here. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have seen it. I hope the audio works, and I'll play it for a bit. Right, I'll mute that now. Were you guys able to hear that? No, uh, I think you sh you had to join with the audio or something. Oh, but... right, fair enough. But anyway, you could you could tell. Uh, so that was the Helen rocket. So it powered by a solid rocket motor, I think seven kilonewtons of thrust. Um, it's it goes supersonic in one second. So it's it's an absolutely crazy mismatch between thrust and weight. Really inefficient, yeah. but it's it's a it's it's very cool to watch. Um, as you can probably tell, it reaches out. It reaches apogee in about 45 seconds. There we go. Um, so it's it's a very quick ascent. This was in uh, this was launched in New Mexico in at the Spaceport America Cup, and that's our drogue parachute deployed. So something actually went wrong here. Uh, the main parachute never actually deployed. So it it descended all the way down purely using its drogue parachute um, because the the gunpowder system we had for ejection it failed when we deployed it. So it burnt through a part of the parachute, um, so the mains never deployed, and the rocket impacted the ground using the drogue parachute. But thankfully, because it was pure carbon fiber, uh, the rocket survived, and we were able to get the data from it and confirm our altitude record. And um, unfortunately, because I wasn't directly involved at the time, I don't know too many of the details, but the one thing I do know is, is the chief designer we had was very good. So. Uh, if you can find the right technical expertise for a project that always, I, I think that's probably like the, the first most important step that takes you a long, long way. Um, so I joined Sunride in 2020. Um, so for the for the 2020 Space Bottom America Cup, so it was the 2019 September team. And the idea was we take the tube from the rocket that broke the altitude record and we changed the payload fairing. So we were trying to be the first team to build a clamshell style fairing. So I was in charge of CFD and aerodynamics for this rocket. So the fairing was designed by me. Uh, I had a couple of guys in the team who were very good with 3D simulations. So they did this on, uh, this is a 3D simulation on ANSYS. Very cool to see the, the oblique shock waves forming at supersonic speeds. Um, unfortunately, we never got to launch this because Spaceport America Cup 2020 was cancelled thanks to COVID and 2021 was online. So this rocket hasn't yet been launched for the last two years, um, but hopefully we're planning to launch it either somewhere in Europe this year or potentially uh, next year in the United States. Um, the, the, the key thing that I learned from this was the division of responsibility because we, we put this team together basically in the middle of COVID and most of us had to work from home. So we needed very good integration to make sure aerodynamics, design, manufacturing, all of that aligned together. So, you know, planning whatever tools you want to use, whether it's you have meetings and you just take notes on Microsoft Word, or if you want to have dedicated tools like Trello or other project management tools, um, however you want to do is fine, but make sure you have good integration. Uh, that's quite key. Uh, the final thing, uh, and perhaps for me, the, the greatest thing about my time at university is the Sunfire project. So this is a, a propulsion program that uh, we started in the summer of 2020. So for my master's year, um, I had a team of people from Sunride and I told them, hey guys, why don't we build a rocket engine for a master's? And they said, you know, you're crazy, but let's do it. And that's that's basically how it started. So we spent the summer of 2020 doing a serious sort of um, technology uh, understanding phase. So we, we read through a lot of material on propulsion, a lot of documents from NASA, uh, trying to understand the intricacies of propulsion. Because once you get into propulsion, 
you're really getting into rocket science um, because that's where you have to make a lot of trade-off decisions. There's no right or wrong answer. If you if you change one parameter, it affects 15 other parameters. And that's where the science of it comes into it. Um, so that was quite a new learning phase. And at my university, there was no basis for propulsion development. So there was no history of it either. So we were starting this from absolute scratch and we had to do everything, you know, like we had to run social media, we had to do the design manufacture, we had to talk to suppliers, talk to prospective um, yeah, sponsors. I got in touch with Skyrora in some of 2020 um, to get propellant for the engine. And basically, uh, about three months ago, somewhere in July, we conducted the cold flow tests for the engine. So there's a video over here. Um, let me mute it. So that's that's the cold flow. That's me behind the system operating it. Uh, so the idea is when you're developing uh, liquid rocket engines, there's usually a three step process. So the first thing you do is you do a cold flow test using either high pressure water, which is what we were using, or you can use the actual propellant where uh, essentially what you're doing is you're validating your design. So you're trying to make sure that you get the right pressures, the right flow rates, your cooling channels are, you know, they meet your specifications. Because you don't want to do all of this while you're igniting the engine for the first time, because the chance of something going wrong is very high. And if something goes wrong, it will be very disastrous. So cold flow test is very important. Uh, next step is hot fire test. So you put propellant, you ignite it, you see what happens. If your engine is in one piece, then you're on the right track. And then finally, you, third stage is you build an engine that you integrate with a rocket and then you launch that. So we basically got the the first phase here, the cold flow tests, which still for one year is a huge achievement considering we started from absolutely nothing. Um, on the left, we've got uh, possibly one thing about engineering that I really love, which is going from renders to reality. So that's SolidWorks image uh, to something we actually built. The chamber is 3D printed, the injection systems are CNC'd, um, the wood was just basically a guy with a saw cutting through it. Uh, so we, we really, the main objective for us is at the time was how do we get this done as quickly and efficiently as possible? And anything that we could do to speed up the process we did. I mentioned uh, tunnel vision in the beginning. So one thing that I made sure to do, I was the head of technical integration for Sunfire. So I was in charge of making sure all of this came together. And one thing I did was we were doing design manufacturing, uh, preparing the documentation all at the same time. So some guys were in the rooms designing, some guys were down hammering pieces of wood together. And, you know, I was either talking to lecturers or on the phone with suppliers um, or just writing documentation for the health and safety teams to get approval. So we were doing that all at the same time. And that's the biggest reason why we were able to do it within one year. Um, so there were days where I would go into university with two others and we would spend 10 hours at the university just running between departments trying to sort things out really small things like getting regulators from there you know someone made a mistake here trying to solve that things like that but in the end it all came together uh we, we the image on the upper right hand side is the the tank feed system with all the piping and the data acquisition systems integrated with the the engine that's in the middle um we did four different tests four different pressures and you know it, it for me, the coolest thing about university was standing behind that rig and, and watching uh, it fire. Because when you when you test rocket engines, it's a very audible experience. Like it's not just the sounds or, or what you see. It's also what you feel because you can feel the thing firing. And that was very cool for me. And I hope at some point you guys get to experience that as well. Um, so, yeah, I thought I'd do a quick uh, sort of lessons learned at the end. Um, first important thing is it's important to be ambitious, but also be realistic. If you're trying to design a liquid rocket engine in one year and you know you're, you want to do electric turbo pumps and all of that, maybe maybe that's a bit too ambitious. Um, another thing is about team structure. So make sure you have a good team with committed people, um, because if you have a large team with people who are not too invested into what they're doing, then you're going to have a mismatch between progress that's made on different aspects. So you'll have some people working very fast and you'll have other very critical parts that aren't moving forward. So the rocket equation, you know, when you have different stages and you finish propellant in one stage, you get rid of it. You don't carry it with you all the way to space. So it's it's a good analogy for maintaining a team. 
Um, something that link, links back to the first points, like how do you how do you maintain that real that uh, reality in your in your planning? It's step by step, be incremental. So if you're doing a UK sets rocket this year, which, like I said, is a very good first step, you know, don't try to do a liquid rocket to the moon next year, right? You know, try maybe a, a spaceport America Cup solid fuel rocket or a two state solid fuel rocket. Always try to develop incrementally. Um, that's that's a very good way to progress. So you're being ambitious, but you're also being realistic, building on what you have done before. Um, something very important when you're starting a project is to criticize it. So what are you doing and why are you doing it? Like if someone comes up with an idea to say, we're going to launch a solid fuel rocket and then we're going to have a propeller on it. Like sounds cool, but why? Like what's the benefit of that? You're adding so much complexity, but you're not getting anything out of it. So make sure that that balance is there. Something very important in project management is scoping. So with student projects, typically you have a one year deadline. So, you know, Space Port America Cup is in July typically. So that's your deadline. You know, you start there and you work backwards. So if we have to launch in July, we have to, you know, go to America in, let's say, two weeks before that. So manufacture should be complete a month before that. Work back all the way to your current position. And then once you're there, start working forward again. So if your last thing was, for example, define the requirements and you only had about two weeks for that, but you realize you need maybe three weeks, then expand that out a bit. And then you get to the end and work back again and work forwards again until you fulfill the first point. Your timeline is ambitious, but realistic. And very important, don't take success for granted. Um, you know, like obviously we do we do things and we don't expect to fail, but there will be delays. When you're doing something for the first time, there will be mistakes. Um, there will be things you don't know about. You will do things and the, there's a great uh, phrase I once heard, experience comes right after you actually need it. And unfortunately that's true. So always think about how you can remove risks. Always think about how you can mitigate risks. Um, and work like hell, like Elon Musk says, work like hell and you'll get there. And I've, I've mentioned tunnel vision a lot. Parallel management is perhaps the biggest project management lesson that I learned um, over the last few years. Always stay on top of things. So yeah, that's basically it. Um, I tried to run through this without trying to bore you guys. So if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to take them. Yeah, I, I like to go first. That was like really good. Uh, listening to your experience of like how you started out, and it's good to know that even you, at some point, you also started from scratch on your projects. I have one question for you. Like as you said, you are an international student, but you managed to get into Skyroda, which is very difficult as an international student to get into um, like the industry because of the fact that they generally work very closely with defense, and it's not that easy. So, how was your experience and journey through it? Well, it's it's like I said, when I came to the UK, I realized uh, early on that I had to push myself more than others um, because of these requirements. Basically, if you want to get into a company like Skyrora, you have to demonstrate that you are better than the average, that, that you're better than, than most of the people out there. So that's why I did all the projects I did. You know, it wasn't that I didn't have anything better to do with my time. Like I wanted to go out and party and all of that, but I realized if I wanted to do what I wanted to do, then I had to make sacrifices. I had to put the time in. So I did that and, you know, I tried to to get as much knowledge as I could to build connections, build experiences. Um, and in that process, you learn a lot because you listen to other people's experiences. You network with a lot of professionals and that gave me a good boost. So I, Skyrora um, put out an application in August, I believe, for an assessment center. I applied to that. There were a thousand applicants, I believe. Out of that, they narrowed it down to about 400, uh, to about 40. Uh, so they had an assessment center with 40 people. I was there for that. Uh, it, very intense. Like it was six hours of continuous uh, tasks, like starting in the morning until the evening, right? One after the other, bang, bang, bang. Um, we were told that it's like three times tougher than any Airbus or Rolls-Royce assessment center you'll ever face. So that was quite cool. Um, and then, yeah, so from those 40, they hired uh, roughly eight people and I was one of them. 
So I, I came on as an operations engineer. Um, the reason I was hired was because of technical skills. And at Skyrora, one of the things we value is something called black box thinking. So if you're given limited information, then how well can you make a decision from that information? So that's one of the things that, that we look for in, in our employees. And if you can meet those two things, then, you know, Skyrora, we are rapidly expanding and you know, I think there's another recruitment drive that will be happening sometime in January or something like that. And we'll be doing many more of these throughout the next year. So keep your eyes open for that. Follow the websites, follow LinkedIn and good luck. Thank you. <laughs> that, that was great. I think someone asked a question in the chat. About Skyrora. So basically Skyrora is a new space uh, rocket company. So we were founded in 2017 um, in, in Scotland, in the UK, and our objective is to enable low cost transportation to low Earth orbit and to sun synchronous orbits. Um, as some of you may know, there has never been a rocket launched to space from European soil ever. Um, Britain had a rocket called Black Arrow in the 1970s, um, which was launched once from Australia. So since then, we haven't had the capability to do that. And Skyrora is one of the companies that are trying to return this capability for multiple reasons. Um, one is that, um, you know, the global satellite, uh, the global launch market, you have many more satellites than you have rockets. So the more, so we have to address this capability. And also for a lot of other reasons, like national security, it's always important for a country to have its own capability to access space. Um, so Skyrora is formed with this objective and uh, we're hoping to launch our first rocket to orbit in these towards the end of uh, next year. Um, we tested uh, a suborbital rocket called Skylark L. We did a static fire test uh, in summer of 2020. And that rocket right now is ready for launch. So it, it should be launching anytime soon, hopefully. Uh, it goes up to 100 kilometers and then returns. We, we did a static test fire of our third stage for our orbital rocket um, a few months ago. So that's a big milestone on the road to orbit. and. We are, we're doing everything we can, as you can see, coming in, working on Saturdays uh, to, to get to that objective. Um, so that's basically who we are. Uh, we're very passionate, very dedicated to our missions. Um, we're all huge fans of space exploration here. Yeah. When I was at university, I was basically one of two or three people, but here everyone is like that. It's a great environment to be a part of. Um, reusable rocketry is not in our plans at the moment, um, because the thing with reusable rockets is it's a late stage thing, so you don't start with reusability because going to orbit is difficult enough. Like it's it's something that I know Astra reached orbit this morning today. Uh, so, you know, congratulations to them, huge achievement. But even with Astra, only three companies in human history have gone to orbit. So it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. So that's the main objective. Um, even if it's takes SpaceX as an example, they, the first objective with Falcon 9 was just to get to orbit. They didn't think about reusability or anything else. And then once you achieve that, then you modify your rocket to be reusable. Um, so yeah, exactly. So the Mura rocket is basically, it's the PLD version of the Skylark L that we have. Um, so yeah, we, we tested our version of that rocket about one year ago and it's, it's ready for launch now. So hopefully you guys should be seeing that some point soon. Yeah, that was that was a that was great uh, learning about this because as you said, like every like our our team has like a lot of people and quite a lot of them are very interested in space and 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 you as you were saying like your journey of like how you got into rocketry about that documentary mine is kind of similar like my my inspiration was the movie October Sky right watch, uh, and uh, yeah that's how I got into model rocketry I was like okay, this is something that I should try and maybe look forward to. Uh, possibly doing that in university, so that's why over oh, here I I'm, I put in there for to start a team, and we are allowed to start. I I want to build up the a basis of for like expanding on future visions, like as you said, like step step by step approach is what you should, what we should be looking at. So our first objective is successfully participating in the UKSS competition. So I have a question on uh, the liquid uh, liquid uh, engine that you tested. Like, what was like the biggest challenge that you faced during that? Apart from the fact that you basically started from scratch, but like in in the component wise, this section was like the most difficult. In terms of technical design, 
Um, yeah. <laughs> I would probably say the injection systems. Um, okay. Because the thing with with um, liquid engines in particular is there's no there's no real textbook you can follow for it. Like there's no here's how you design liquid engines because it's one like I said it's rocket science. It's very hard. It's very complex. And secondly, um, there's a lot of variation. So you can't. Uh, much of engineering is statistics. So, you know, like if you take advanced parts of, let's say, fluid dynamics or whatever, it's it's average of equations that have been built up based on hundreds of years of experience. But with rocket engines, you can't really do this because if you take a three kilonewton engine that's powered by liquid oxygen and kerosene and a 20 kilonewton engine by liquid oxygen and kerosene, the things you get are very different from each other. Like it doesn't scale linearly at all. So it's it's very difficult for anyone to establish trends in that way. I mean, if you do, you probably would get a Nobel Prize or something. <laughs> um, so you really have to adopt a physics first principles approach. It's like we have, let's say, oxidizer. We're trying to get it into the combustion chamber. How do we do it? How do we use you know orifices, stuff like that? Um, and the problem with that is there's so much variability it's very difficult to decide on specific decisions so one important thing that we recognized early on is experimental testing is extremely important with rocket engines like if you want to do cfd or fea you're talking about very complex simulations so unless you have someone who is like an expert in that don't even try it yeah no like, no <laughs> we had a guy who was doing uh, injection CFD, and this guy is one of the best CFD engineers I know. And it it took him one year to be able to do a preliminary model for the injection systems. Whereas if you build an experimental model, you can very quickly build new CNC plates and test new designs. So if, it, if you're doing rocket engines, adopt a very experimental approach. Um, that's extremely important. OK, thank you. Uh, we have another question in the chat. It depends on which component you're talking about. So, for example, um, within the, the team, my technical role was designing the, the structure for the injection systems. So I was doing a lot of reading from, um, what do you call them? The the bolting standards, I forget the name. Uh, what, Riley Hobson or something? I don't know. No, no, it's it's when you have flanges and, and you bolt them together. I forget this. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Oh, that I thought I I thought you were going to them both. No, no. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm also forgetting yeah. right now. Sorry, I, I can't recall it off the top of my head, but I basically spent all of my time reading through this documentation um, to because we the Sunfire engine that we built, it had three flanges uh, for the okay. injection systems. So it, it so we had the thrust chamber was regeneratively cooled, so we would take fuel, circulate it around the chamber, and then to cool the engine, and then inject it into the injection systems for combustion. Uh, so a flange is basically, it's a it's a, a plate of metal that you have uh, a hole in for, for whatever purpose. Like you can transport liquid through it, you can have a shaft, something like that. And a flange has uh, holes around it for bolts, so you can basically bolt them together. That's how they're attached to things. Um, so we had three flanges attached to the combustion chamber, and then on top we had the injection system for the oxidizer. Um, and and my job was to make sure that all of that stayed together when you fired the engine, which isn't really uh, a fun job. It's a lot of responsibility. Um, so I, I basically spent a lot of time reading through the the relevant mechanical standards for it, uh, the ASME standards. That's the word I was looking for. Um, okay. <laughs> ASME, yeah. Uh, so the ASME has a lot of detailed standards on pressure vessel design. So that's basically it's a lot of statistics. So those equations aren't complex. But like I said, there's a lot of variation depending on the type of flanges, depending on the bolts, depending on materials, blah, 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 pressures, temperatures. Um, so I spent a lot of time on that. Um, the most mathematically complex thing on a rocket engine is probably combustion. Um, it's it's. It's like a, a, a black magic science, basically. <laughs> so the equations that drive them are very complex. I, I have a friend who, who worked on Sunfire. He's now doing a PhD in combustion. Um, and I think he's he's already gone bald or something. So it's extraordinarily complex to do that. Um, we didn't do any serious combustion analysis simply because it was just too complex to try and too complex to do. So 
the cooling chamber was another thing. So we had, um, I think, sort of second, third order differential equations that that uh, ran the calculations behind the cooling uh, channel analysis. But okay. that you could basically drive from research papers and stuff like that. That's been relatively well studied. So that's yeah. not too bad. Um, but yeah, combustion was a, was a big thing. Um, so another question. That's a good question. Um, I have always tried to be more experimental because I believe engineering is fundamentally an experimental thing. Like it doesn't matter how fancy CFD you can do. At the end of the day, you have to build something. You have to demonstrate something with it. Like you can sit down at a laptop and you can do a CFD of an engine with a combustion temperature of 1 million degrees, but you just can't build that, right? So that CFD doesn't really help you. Um, yeah, exactly. If it works, it works. <laughs> um, so like the, the theoretical knowledge is very important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you should ignore it. It's, it's extremely important. And I have spent many sleepless nights trying to understand theory. Um, and they, they tie in together in a, in a way that's quite important. But I think you need a balance between the two, if, if, um, especially if you want to do stuff like working at Skyrora or something. If you want to be a CFD engineer at Rolls-Royce, then sure, you know, like that path is open. And I know people who do that, but um, the fun stuff is in the experimental stuff. So it's good to have a balance. Yeah. It was, again, it was really great talking to you. Thank you for taking your time for us and uh, for this talk. It was really great very informative for us because we're just starting out as I said. Uh, thank you again. <laughs> no worries, yeah, and uh, I wish you guys good luck. You know, it's, uh, I, I, I agree to do this because it's it's always, you know, great to see students trying stuff out like this and, um, yeah. you know, again, this is like any, any big uh, rocketry project or any big space project starts from things like this. So those two guys that I had at the beginning of my profile, uh, Werner von Braun and Sergei Korolev, these guys are arguably the greatest engineers in, in rocket science and human history. And they started out building rockets at university. Like you can see pictures of them carrying yeah. like two <laughs> rockets on their shoulders. So this is a good place to start. And, you know, always remember your dreams and never give up yeah. on them. Thank you. Thank you so much again. <laughs>